something about the spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good. Good, good. Do you feel good? Good, good, good. Do you feel, feel good? Clap your hands because there's something about the spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel good. Good, good, sad I feel down in my soul because there's something about the spirit Jesus that makes me feel good. Yeah, I got peace, 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 and I got peace down in my soul because there's something about the spirit of Jesus. Give me such peace, yes, sir, the Lord, I can serve, sir, oh, I want to serve the Lord, yes, my Lord, because there's something about the Spirit of Jesus that gives me good, good, joy, joy, I got joy, joy, I got joy down in my soul. Soul to me, cause there's something about the spirit of Jesus that gives me such joy. Do you feel good? Yeah, you feel good, 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 good. Do you feel good? Yeah, because there's something about the spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good. I feel good. the spirit y'all let the spirit of the lord it arise among us let the spirit i said arise among us let the praises of the king let it rise among us let it rise
be seated. Amen, amen, and welcome to Impact. We have asked, we have just prayed that the Spirit of the Lord would rise among us. Uh, for all of you that are here, members and, and visitors, uh, thank you for being here and being a part of the Spirit rising among us. It takes all of us. Thank you for being here and participating in that, participating in the Spirit rising among us. So if you're a visitor, welcome. If you're a middle school or high school boy, welcome. we got a crowd of them. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, welcome books are coming by. Uh, it's very helpful for you. If you take a second and fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. It's helpful to our leadership. Uh, but thank you for being here, and we're going to continue our time together. Oh, arm yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. is the Son of God. It says Jesus is the Son of God. And I How sweet the sound, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved the wretch like me, said I said I said. Side of the Lord. Help me sing the song, y'all. Ooh, I'm yourself. Thank you, Harvey. That was a great song. Good morning, church. Welcome, everyone. It's another great day at Impact, is it not? Amen. Amen. Most of us know that communion is an act of breaking bread and eating it. It symbolizes Christ's body, which is given for us, and drinking the wine that symbolizes the blood he shed for our sins. It's also known as the Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. 
But partaking in the Lord's Supper is more than just practicing an ancient tradition. It's an act of obedience towards God. It is taken by Christians to remember what our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, has done on the cross to save us. So whenever we partake in communion, we're entering into a covenant with God, a promise to always remember the sacrifice of his son on the cross. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious and merciful Father, we come to you in faith and love. We come to you in obedience to you, Lord. We take this bread in honor of your sacrifice for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only As we uh, take the wine, uh, I want to read a prayer from Paul to the Ephesians. It shows God's love. In, um, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. I pray out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long 
and high and deep is the Lord, uh, the love of Christ. Let's go to prayer. Dear gracious and merciful Father, again, we come to you in faith and love. We come to you again in obedience to you, Lord. We take this wine in honor of your sacrifice for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. still nearer close to thy heart draw me my savior so precious thou art fold me oh fold me close to thy breast Shall As we take our offering today, uh, let's be reminded that the word tithe in Hebrew language simply means tenth. In the book of Numbers, God's people were instructed to give a tenth of what they earned or produced to God as a way to be obedient and worshipful to the Lord. Throughout the Old Testament, God's people are prompted to give a tenth of what they've earned to God. In Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. When believers honor God with their wealth, there is a great reward and blessing that comes because of their faithfulness. God blesses his children in so many ways, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, when we remain obedient and live according to his ways. Ultimately, God giving a tithe to the Lord is proof of trust in the Lord's provision. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious and merciful Father, again, we thank you for all your blessings, grace, and mercy. We could never repay you for the rewards and gifts you provide to us. But take our offering, offering today that it may help your church to make an impact in your community as we show our love and faith for your majesty. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I fail to recognize you out there in virtual land. We want you to be a part of our worship. So we're going to say welcome to you and uh, join in with us as we sing this next song. Hold to God's unchanging hands. Time is filled with swift sensation. No, the earth unmoved can stand. Feel your hopes on things eternal. Hold oh, oh, to God's changing hand. Hold oh, to, to God's changing hand. Trust in the Lord now, trust. Sing Him who will not leave you. What, what? So ever you may bring, by your friends forsaken, you still feel more close to Him. To hold on to his hand, to my God's changing hand, and we better build our hope, hold on things eternal, turn up, Ooh, uh, hold on to God's changing hand, on a dance and a hold on, hold on, a hold to his, hold to God. <laughs> I want you to hold on to his hand. Come on in. Changing hand. Feel your hopes. Your hopes on things each. Change her. Oh, hold on to God's changing hand. Come on and come on and hold and hold on to it. To, to, to God's changing Hold on to to, to God's changing <laughs> hand. I'll feel your hope. Hold so things eternal. Hold on to God's changing hand. One more time, I want to hold and hold on to, to, to. <laughs> I want to hold on to, hold on to This time we'll dismiss our children, ages three through seven, to go out this direction. While I do that, I did want to thank Harvey for his leadership today. We asked God, <laughs> asked God earlier that the Spirit of the Lord would rise among us, and Harvey, despite uh, the flesh being not what it used to be and weak in some ways, his poor eyesight and various other issues, the Spirit is, is, is willing and is working through Harvey today. Uh, Kind of, we got some people out sick or out of town, and Harvey's kind of our primary uh, leader today, and we appreciate you doing that so much. I wanted to say that. Morning, everybody. Morning. How are you? It's good to be together today. Amen. Um, Patrick, I'm gonna allow you the opportunity now to talk about my bad eyesight and my. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, man, but no, hey, we, we all come here with something, don't we? We all come here with something. Um, sometimes it's, it's more obvious on some people than it is on others, but we all come here with something. And uh, how good it is to be together with people who lift us up and encourage us when, they're, when we're in the middle of that something. I think we got some boys that just got back this morning. We got some boys who went on a retreat this weekend. Y'all stand up. Y'all give these young men a big old round of applause. All right, y'all sit down. Jeremy, this is the only time that you are allowed to fall asleep during one of my sermons. You just came back from a retreat with a whole bunch of young men. 41. Y'all hear that? 41. 41 young men who could have done just about anything that they wanted to do with their weekend. And yet 41 young men decided to get together and go out of town in the name of Jesus. They could have been playing video games. They could have been doing watching TV, watching Oklahoma beat Texas yesterday, watching the Astros win. Could have been doing all kinds of things, but they were gathered together in the name of Jesus. You you hear all the time the, the world's in bad hands with the... No, it's not. These young men and these young women... giving their lives over to God and spending their weekend in his name? Wow. Wow. I want to be like y'all. Maybe someday when I grow up, I can be like like Um, y'all. I've been on my share of of youth group trips. Uh, It can can get a little prickly every once in a while because you are in a confined space with people who normal, most of the time you have to spend just an hour with at church, and then all of a sudden you're in confined space with them for an entire weekend or an entire week. How, how many of y'all did I spend in a van driving to mission trip or, or something with? Raise your hand. All right, we got, we got a few, right? Um, it gets a little prickly, doesn't it? You, you can get on each other's nerves after, after a little bit of time. Um, but uh, I'm sure that didn't happen this weekend at all. There was none of that, right? Paul, Jeremy, not, none of that, right? Nothing. No. Okay. All right. Um, anybody ever been to been to a uh, a store and there was a sale going on, and it was a really really good sale because the sale was an as is sale. Have you been there? You've been to the as-is section at a store? It's as-is because, well, there's probably something wrong with it, right? Uh, They're not going to tell you what's wrong with it. You're going to have to figure that out after you buy it, or maybe you you give it a good look over uh, when you're there in the store, but usually there's going to be like a zipper that won't zip, or one pant leg that's shorter than the other one or uh, a stain somewhere that you can't see it, or a stitch that's come undone. The best as-is sale that I ever happened upon was at REI. You all know the store REI, outdoor store? Um, They had a, they used to have uh, sales back in the day for stuff that people had returned. Uh, And so you got to go in and and shop from stuff that people had returned. And I happened, it was, it's an as-is sale, right? Uh, I picked up this pair of this pair of, of shoes, uh, they were probably $90 shoes, and I got them for 10 bucks. I got them for 10 bucks because someone had returned them because the lace had broken. So I bought a $10 pair of shoes and about a 10 cent lace, $90 pair of shoes. Sometimes you can walk into an as is sale and you walk out thinking, hey, this is pretty good. Sometimes, sometimes you get home and you're like, oh. No exchanges, no refunds, nope, 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 it's yours, you bought it forever. Jaden got something from the garage sale uh, this last year. It was one of those big blow-up things that goes in the yard, and it was supposed to be one thing. 
he, but he never opened up the box, right? And inside the box, it was something completely and entirely different. Uh, so no exchanges, no refunds, nothing. It's yours, done, bought, right? Um, when you deal with human beings, you pretty often come to the as-is corner of the universe, yeah? All of us sitting in this room are sitting here because we were accepted by a loving Savior as is. We entered into this place as is. Now, that doesn't mean that, that we want to stay there, right? We're going to continue growing and we're going to continue learning and we're going to continue molding and shaping our lives into the people who God created us to be. But, but when we started out, we were, we were taken as is. As is. We're in this new series. It's got a strange title, A Porcupine Church. Porcupine Church. So here's the deal. Porcupine is a member of the rodent family. I don't know if you realize that, but if you see a bigger one and you see their nose poking out, it looks, it looks like it's a rodent. The little bitty ones, are, they're really, really cute. But um, it's, it's a member of the rodent family, and it has about 30,000 quills that are attached to its body. Each quill can be driven into an enemy, and the enemy's body heat actually causes this microscopic barb on its quill. You know, like a fish hook has a barb on it, so it catches well, there's these little barbs on porcupine quills, and when it's, when it's driven inside an enemy, the enemy's body heat will cause this microscopic barb to expand and become more firmly embedded. That's why it's hard to take out a porcupine quill is because that barb expands. Uh, the wounds from a porcupine barb can fester, and the most dangerous ones, uh, if, if they're infected and they're near a vital organ, can actually be fatal for whatever they were injected into. Uh, porcupine is not generally regarded as a lovable animal because of this. Its Latin name, Erythizin, I'm totally mispronouncing this, I don't know Latin, Erythizin dorsatum means irritable back. Irritable back, and they definitely have one. Uh, we have books and movies to celebrate almost every conceivable, every, every animal you can think of, right? You've got dogs and cats and horses, but we've also got, got movies and books about pigs and spiders and dolphins, bears, killer whales. Even, even the skunks have Pepe Le Pew, right? Um, even the skunks have Pepe Le Pew, but... Uh, what movies are there about porcupines? <laughs> As a general rule, porcupines have two methods for handling relationships. They either withdraw or they attack. They run away up a tree or they attack. Anything that comes near them. Uh, they're generally solitary animals. You know, wolves, they run in packs. Sheep, they huddle in flocks. Uh, we talk about herds of elephants, gaggles of geese. We've even got a murder of crows and a swarm of mosquitoes. But there's no special name for a group of porcupines because they travel alone. But they don't always want to be alone. In the late fall, porcupines' thoughts turn to love. In the fall, not the spring for them. But love is kind of a risky business when you're a porcupine. Females are only open to proposition one time a year. And a female porcupine's no is about the most widely respected turndown in the entire animal kingdom. Fear and anger make them very, very dangerous little creatures to be around. This is the porcupine's dilemma. How do you get close without getting hurt? How do you get close without getting hurt? And church, isn't that our dilemma too? 
sometimes. Here we are, a whole bunch of as-is people who bring all of our past, all of our experiences, all of our flaws, all of our stuff to the table when we get together. Every one of us carries our own little arsenal. Our barbs have names like rejection, condemnation, resentment, arrogance, selfishness, envy, contempt. You know, some people hide them better than others, but you get close enough and you spend enough time around each other, like on a middle school, high school boys retreat over the weekend, and uh, you're going to find out that they're there. And what happens is sometimes those barbs can burrow under the skin of both friends and enemies alike, and they can wound, and they can fester. They can even kill. And we too then learn how to survive through a combination of withdraw and attack, and withdraw and attack. And that's how we deal with church sometimes. One of the hardest things to realize when we come to church is the number one, everybody comes as is. The number two, I have, or maybe number one actually, I have my own quills. And all of us do, don't we? If we were honest, if we sat down and thought about it for a little bit, we all have our own quills. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said people enter into relationships with their own particular ideals and dreams of what a community can look like. Have, did you ever, you, you come to Christ and you're like, oh, I have this wonderful, amazing family that I can be a part of. And then, boom, something happens. Anybody been hurt by church before? Anybody been hurt by people in church before? Did that happen to anybody in the last week? He wrote these words, God's grace quickly frustrates these kinds of dreams. A great disillusionment with others, with Christians in general, and if we're fortunate with ourselves, is bound to overwhelm us as surely as God desires to lead us to an understanding of genuine Christian community. The sooner that this moment of disillusionment comes over the individual and the community, the better for both. Those who love their dream of a Christian community itself become destroyers of that Christian community, even though their personal intentions may be ever so earnest and honest and sacrificial. In other words, in other words, the perception of the Christian community is often idealistic. And when it when it really hits, when one realizes that they're in a community with imperfect people, disillusionment can set in, and people far too often walk away from Christ-centered community. But every Christian has a desperate need for Christian community. And struggling through the difficulties and conflicts, <laughs> they're more than worth it. Our need for community with people and the God who made us is to the human spirit what food and air are to the body. Absolutely necessary. We were made to know and be in community even though that community can be difficult. We were made to know community. And that's why, that's why loneliness can be so painful. Loneliness can be so painful. Check this out. We're going to get biblical with this in a second. This is an observation that somebody made. Some researchers, one of the most thorough research projects on relationships, it's called the Alameda County Study. It was headed by a Harvard uh, social scientist, tracked the lives of about 7,000 people over nine years. Here's what, here's what they found. The most isolated people were three times more likely to die than those with strong relational connections. Did you catch that? The most isolated people were three times more likely to die 
than those with strong relational connections. And people who had bad health habits, such as smoking or poor eating habits or alcohol use, um, they had those health habits, bad health habits, but they, but they had strong social ties. Those people lived significantly longer than people who had great health habits but were isolated. Isn't that something? It's better to eat Twinkies with good friends than to eat broccoli alone. <laughs> we need community. Listen, in, in the Genesis, Genesis account of creation, the same phrase keeps popping up over and over and over and over and over again. And God said, and it was so, and God saw that it was, it was good. The writer is emphasizing that everything that exists is the effortless activity of an unimaginably powerful God. And it's all so amazing. And this is the song of creation. And God said, and it was so, and it was. And that's the song of creation until, until the final act. The song comes to a screeching halt. God creates man in his own image, and God looks at this man who bears his own likeness and says, not good. Not good. Why does God look at man and say, not good? Because he likes cute, cuddly little bunny rabbits better? Well, I don't think so. It's actually a radical comment about the absolute importance of human relationships. What's striking is when God says it's not good, the fall hasn't happened yet. Eve hasn't reached out to a tree and grabbed a fruit. Adam hasn't eaten it. She hasn't eaten it. None of that's happened. There's no sin. There's no disobedience. There's nothing to mar the relationship between God and man. Nothing. The human being is in a state of perfect intimacy with God. He walks with God in the garden. He is known and he's loved by his creator to the core of his being, yet the word God uses to describe him is not good and alone. Alone. God says that this, I don't, know, I don't know if you've heard it said like this, but sometimes in church circles when, when people feel lonely, maybe somebody's told you this before, uh, it might say something like this, you know, inside every human being is a God-shaped void that no other person can fill. You heard something like that before? It's an absolutely true statement, right? We have a desperate need for God. We cannot exist without him. We have a desperate need to be in community with God. It's very true. Humans are no substitute for God. But apparently, according to the writer of Genesis, God creates inside a man a kind of human-shaped void that God himself will not fill. No substitute will fill this need in you for human relationship, not money, not achievement, not busyness, not books, not even God himself. We have a need for human interaction. We have a need for humans, each of us. Community is what you were created for. It's God's desire for your life. It's the one, two, one of two indispensable conditions for human flourishing. You need God, and you need people. It's from Mark chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Um, I think we're, we're mostly familiar with, with the story. Jesus is teaching. He's teaching in, inside a house, and this house is full of people. It's a big crowd. Crowds surrounded Jesus all the time. Uh, some men came bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man 
who was carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him, get him to... Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above, above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. And then he goes on to heal the man of his um, ailments also, and the man walks off carrying, carrying his mat. Imagine for a moment what the world would have been like in ancient times for a paralyzed man. His whole life, his entire life, would have been lived on a three-foot by six-foot mat. Somebody has to feed him. Someone has to carry him. Someone has to clothe him. Someone has to move him to keep him from being covered in bed sores. Someone has to clean him. There's nothing that can be done medically for this man. There's no surgeries. There's no rehab programs. There's no treatment centers. Um, in his day and time, there were virtually no ways for him to be able to contribute to society. He would have gone through life um, as a beggar, and he would have even needed help to do that. He would have needed someone to lay him down by the side of the road so that he could do that. I'm sure he dreams. I'm sure he dreams of having a healthy body. He dreams of walking and running and doing these wonderful, amazing things, but then he wakes up. And he's, uh, he's stuck. He's stuck in a body that holds him prisoner. He looks up at the ceiling of a room that he can never walk out of. He looks at a mat that makes up his whole world, knowing that he will never, ever be free. He's got no money, no job, no influence, no family, seemingly not much of a future. His his as is tag is three feet wide and six feet long. And it's very, very visible. It's very visible. What's he got going for him? I'll tell you what he's got going for him. He's got some amazing friends. Scripture just calls them men, but I, I, even if this is their only interaction, I, I'm going to call them friends. Is that okay with you? We don't know how long these four men carried him, but wow, wow. So because of this man's physical condition, the deck was, was kind of stacked against any kind of friendships emerging at all. Um, he came with an as-is tag, and it was very, very visible. The ancient world, it was harsh. And harsh isn't even really the right word. It was, I don't know what the right word is, but harsh is like way down on the scale of what the ancient world would have been like for this man. Check this out. Greeks regularly disposed of newborn infants with physical anomalies. So if an infant was born with some kind of physical anomaly, they would have been discarded. Aristotle, we know Aristotle, right? Wrote a lot of great things. He also wrote this, let there be a law that no deformed child shall be raised. In Rome during the 5th century BC, there was actually a law that came on the books that said to quickly kill a deformed child. In Israel, there was another stigma. A common assumption was that if people were suffering physically, that they had brought it on themselves by sinning. And so people would avoid you at all costs. And yet, these four men didn't shy away from being his friends. I wonder what the paralyzed man would have gone through in order to be friends with this group of men. We usually talk about like the friends and how, how amazing these friends are, and they are. They're, they're incredibly amazing, but, but he must have wrestled with some stuff, right? To have friends at all. It, he, he had to have wrestled with his sense of being dependent sometimes. We can understand that. We're, we're used to being able to do things for ourselves. I, I had a shoulder surgery couple of shoulder surgeries recently, and I'll tell you what, not being able to use your arm and not being able to do all the things that you normally do, it's frustrating. 
It's frustrating. And every time that you go to try to do something that you can't do anymore and you have to be dependent on someone else to do that for you, it's difficult. I suspect at times that he probably became jealous of their independence. I mean, <laughs> they could walk. Everybody, if they, if they were hanging out, if they were friends for longer than just a moment, he's the only one who couldn't walk home. Sometimes he probably secretly wished that he could trade places with one of them. He must have struggled with how they saw him and how they saw his need. Can you imagine what his... What his self-worth must have been like? Listen, it is a very vulnerable thing to have someone carry your mat. When someone is carrying your mat, they see you in your greatest weakness. They might even hurt you if they drop you. This mat, which according to society, should have created this big gulf between him and them, instead became an opportunity for acceptance, for servanthood. This group becomes a fellowship of, of the mat, a fellowship of brokenness. Wherever human beings love and accept and serve each other in the face of weakness and need, there's this same, there's this same uh, fellowship of the mat. Here's the truth about us. Here's the truth about us. All of us, all of us have a mat. Let the mat stand as a picture of our brokenness and our imperfection, of our as-is-ness. We're going to put that one in the dictionary next week. As-is-ness. It's the little as-is tag that I most desire to hide from everybody. But when we allow other people to see our mat... When we give and receive help with each other, you know what becomes possible? Healing. When we share our mat with others, healing becomes possible. Here's the deal. There is no ideal community. I would love to tell you if you're visiting with us or if you're watching online for the very first time, I would love to tell you that this is the absolute, most amazing, perfect church that ever existed on the face of the planet. I would love to be able to tell you that, but the reality is that if you walked in these doors, you have already found out that we are a very imperfect people. We don't have it all together. And I don't think there is an ideal community. See, community is made up with people with all their richness, with all of our God-given talents, with all of our God-given gifts, with the ways that we can help each other and all those things. But community is also made up of our weakness. Each and every single one of us, of our poverty, of people who accept and forgive each other, who are vulnerable with each other. Humility and trust are far more at the foundation of community than perfection. How often do we talk about church like that? How often do we talk about church like that? I've said it before. I'm going to keep saying it. We are not here today this morning, right now, because we have it all together. We are here today, this morning, because we are a people who have realized that we don't have it all together and we have an absolute, complete, and total desperate need for Jesus, Amen. who died on the cross on our behalf. 
so that we might be reunited with him and with God in heaven. We are here because we don't have it all together. But church, we know the one who does. And he's the one who's going to get us there. Listen, if you want deep friendship, if we want to meet this need, this desperate need that we have inside of us for community, you can't always be strong. You can't always be the strong one. Sometimes you're going to have to let someone else carry your mat. Our mats, they're usually what we're most proud of, what we're the least proud of, and what we're most likely to hide. So often we're convinced that if other people knew about our mats, they would stay away from us. But in reality, it's our mats that form a connecting point for deeper relationship. None of us would be in this room if we did not have a mat. If we could do it on our own, none of us would be here in this community whatsoever, and that is the basis for this community that we have assembled here in this room today. It is what we have in common. It is that none of us can do it on our own, and we desperately need Jesus. Many, many years ago, many years ago, There's probably might, be, might even be a couple people in the room who were there for this. Um, was having trouble. We just couldn't get uh, uh, couldn't get our high schoolers to talk. Couldn't get them to talk to each other. We couldn't get them to be real with each other. We couldn't and and it, like like we would just have these fake conversations all the time. You ever been you ever been in that group where ever like the conversation is just fake and you're ready to dart out because you don't know what to say and you're talking about the weather. That's what our conversations were like all the time uh, in, in our high school youth group. So we decided one night, uh, I had these, these two interns, uh, Shantavi, Sean Uvang, and Sid Gutierrez. Uh, and we were, we were meeting at my house. We used to do like a dinner and Bible study thing at my house every week during the summer. Um, and we would, we would, so we're, we're there. We're, we've got like, 40 of us assembled into a room that should only fit like 10. Um, and uh, we opened up, and Shantavi and Sid had both been through some, some rough stuff. Let's just say it like that. They'd been through some rough stuff. And they decided that they wanted to share what they'd been through. And they opened up. Never seen eyes peering into someone when they were talking or giving a lesson more than that moment. Every eye in that room was on them. It was dead silent. You could have heard a pin, heard a pin drop. Shantavi finished and then Sid told his there's no, <laughs> there's no dry eye in the room, not a single one. They shared vulnerable stuff, not just stuff that they'd been through, but ways that they had maybe handled some of it that, was, that they weren't proud of. They put themselves out there. That's hard to do. Neither of them, I, I would venture to guess, had ever done that in a church setting ever before. Ever. We're scared to do that. We're scared to be vulnerable. We've been a part of church and we know that everybody is as is and everybody's got some quills that they're ready to stick in us. But you know what happened? When they were vulnerable and when they opened up, there wasn't a single person in that room who didn't share their Matt and their vulnerabilities and the stuff that they were dealing with. It went two hours longer than it was supposed to. But I'll tell you what, when we are willing to be vulnerable, 
It is amazing what can happen. And our youth group was never, ever the same after that. In a good way. In a good way. Healing could begin. It is hard to help your brother or your sister if you don't know what they're dealing with and what they're going through. Isn't it? Can't help somebody if you don't want to know what they're going through. Just this most incredible moment. Incredible moment. You know, relationship does happen. Even for porcupines. On rare occasion, one porcupine will share space with another. They become friends. Porcupines eventually learn how to keep their barbs to themselves. Not only that, they even figure out how to get together at least long enough to make sure that another generation of porcupines will come along. Males and females, they may remain together for some days before they mate. A lot of times, sometimes, they even touch paws while they stand up on their hind feet and they do what has become known as the dance of the porcupines. Only God could have thought up two porcupines dancing. There really is an, ancient, an answer to the ancient question, how do porcupines continue to exist from generation to generation with all of those barbs? The answer is, they realize that they have them. They realize that they themselves come as is. They eventually learn to pull in their quills and they learn to dance. Church, we've got to be a people who realize that we have barbs. We have to be a people who realize that we have mats. We have to be a people who are not content with staying where we are. We must be a people who continually admit that we need to grow. Do we ever reach a point where we've got it all figured out and we have no need to learn and to grow and to be better? No, never. I hope not. If you're there, I hope that, that you walk a day, away today saying, you know what? I can still grow too. How do we respond to people when they lay down their mat in front of us? Are we willing to lay down our mats and to be vulnerable with the people around us? I believe this is where healthy, good Biblical church community begins with being a people who recognize that we don't have it all together and that we are here because all of us have a complete and total desperate need for Jesus. Otherwise, there's no point in being here. That's why we're here. Let's be more vulnerable. Let's do church in a way that we can help people heal. Let's do church in a way where we can help ourselves heal. Let's be a people who realize that we have barbs and sometimes we need to pull them in so that we can be more helpful than hurtful in this amazing kingdom that God has brought us into. Amen? Amen. If there's anything that you need prayers for today. If there's anything that you have going on, if there's anything that we can do for you, one way that you can do that today is you can come when we sing in just a moment. If that's not for you, grab the person next to you. Grab the person across the room. Grab me. Grab her. Grab him. Grab somebody. And put your mat out. There is no reason for you to continue sitting in the bottom of a pit 
with a broken ladder. No reason. No reason. If you want to come forward while we sing, I can promise you that there is not one person in this room today who will look at you with anything other than a love. Because we got our own quills too. We got our own quills too. Let's stand and sing. Turn my heart, O Lord, like rivers of water. Turn my heart, O Lord, by your hand, till my whole life flows in the river of your spirit, and my name brings honor to the land, and Lord, I surrender. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dennis, uh, for a great lesson. Um, and I think that should be another prayer that uh, we allow God to be vulnerable in our lives, uh, that we can accept him. Uh, in order to be vulnerable, it takes a lot of courage. Uh, it takes a lot of desire. You have to want that. Uh, and it goes with prayer. Um, it takes courage to ask people to pray for you, things of that. Um, sometimes we run into people who are asking for prayers and they have all these situations. We have them as well. Um, and I like to say, I don't, I don't like to say that I'm going to pray for you. I tell them my prayer is your prayer. I'm going to pray with you because I'm hoping that their prayer, they're asking me to pray for, they already started that. 
and I could jump along. I could be another, you know, sender of that message instead of, you know, me being the start of it. Um, so as we write prayer requests, I hope that we're also praying for this uh, on our own, uh, with each other, things of that, because that speaks impact. Uh, it makes it more powerful. Uh, so just a word of encouragement I want to just share is like, no, I'm going to pray with you. And uh, it takes a lot of courage to ask people to pray for you and pray with you, uh, things of that. Um, so we have uh, Champions uh, Church of Christ. Uh, they're going to be pro providing our meal today. Uh, if you're... Um, if you're uh, if you're a first timer, uh, we have a meal uh, in a Spanish auditorium. Everybody's welcome. Uh, there is plenty. Uh, if you can help set up chairs and uh, tables and all of that, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, I have Elijah. He's asking for prayer for his uh, best friend's mom. Uh, I think she lost her son, so he's asking for heal uh, healing and um, just you know understanding through that through that process. Uh, Miss Barry is asking for prayers for a spiritual walk, uh, health, um, and financial issues. Uh, also, is praying for summer as well. Uh, Ruby uh, Tang is uh, asking for prayers for just family acceptance. Uh, she was recently baptized, and um, just family values and different understandings of different ways of life. Uh, some of them are not very understanding of that, and I think that's a prayer for us. Uh, sometimes. You know, we talk about God with our families that they don't understand it. They don't want to hear it. Uh, they keep a burial up and things of like that. And let's continue to do that so they can, you know, soonly believe. Uh, let's not just be discouraged because they're blocking it off. Like, let's continue to spread the word, things of like that. And let's not give up on them. Uh, Daniel's uh, asking for prayer for his mom and dad. Uh, Claudia's asking for prayer for uh, Juanita and her siblings. Uh, Destiny is praying for her birthday next week. All righty. Uh, uh, Lakeep is uh, praying for friends and family. Uh, he also uh, wants to make sure everybody stays safe. Uh, and also thankful for the boys retreat we had this past weekend. Uh, Hope is praying for her school. Praying that it gets better. She's praying for her safety. Um, and she um, prays for just uh, no more threats uh, at the school and all schools. Uh, Michael uh, Guffey has asked for prayers for Roy and Marquise. Um, just praying for comfort and blessings for them. Ashley Harris is uh, praying for her family and uh, business, financial uh, meetings, uh, permanent housing and all that. And I'm sure we all have people who are sick, uh, unhealthy, uh, dealing with uh, mental um, discomfort, all of that. So um, that could be a prayer request for all of us. And also just, I pray that we continue to be um, people who are willing to let other people pray with them, pray for them, and let's not hold our, um, our discomfort uh, and just hold it to ourselves. Like, let's share that, all right? Um, because again, we're a church, we're here for each other, and we want to be that. And that's another way to be vulnerable around people. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you for uh, just the many ways you blessed us um, through this short morning. I pray that as we continue to, uh, to glorify you, live this day, I pray that uh, everything we do uh, embraces you and embodies you. Be with us uh, as we continue to uh, walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, and I pray that um, we do that in your name. Uh, bless this meal, bless us, and um, continue to help us uh, be people of your world. In Jesus' name, amen. We have uh, one we more. Have a, we have a baptism um, to my left, so let's just please stay seated for that. All right, thank you. This is, this is Manuel Pineda, a good friend of mine. 
he has been attending impact since uh, two years uh, two years ago. Uh, he found up this building open one of these days, and he said, "I want to go in." And he started to come with his family. And that was two years ago, and now he he already made a decision to follow Jesus, and he's going to get baptized today. Manuel, eh, ¿usted cree que Jesucristo es el Hijo de Dios? Sí, lo creo. ¿Puede confesar que Jesús es el Hijo de Dios? Eh, confieso que Jesús es el Hijo de Dios. Y, y que es una bendición eh, estar aquí. Y no es por, por casualidad, sino que Él tiene algo preparado para uno siempre. Y gracias, gracias por, por todo esto y... Y gracias a esta gran comunidad también que me encontré en día y soñaba con ser parte de ella. Basically, he's saying that thank you so much for the blessing that this church represents to me. And this is a beautiful community. And I was dreaming about one day I want to be part of Impact. And now this is today. Today is the day. Vamos a bautizarle entonces.